so I'll be done by noon, I promise. Yeah, I don't have my clock hung up this morning. Funny story about my clock. I got a clock last night and uh, for my birthday, <clears throat> and uh, every hour on the hour, um, this deep voice comes on and quotes scripture. The Lord Jesus, rising a great time before dawn, removed himself to a solitary place and there prayed. So anyway, we forget about this gift. It's sitting on the counter and in a box. And I'm drinking coffee this morning, reading my Bible, and praying for y'all and for the people who gave me this gift. <laughs> and out of this box, I hear this, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> I thought it was a demon from hell had invaded my home, and I was praying, but I was not praying the kind of prayer. Anyway, so, so I, I remember that I've received this gift, and I get a good chuckle out of it. So in about an hour, Wendy's in there, and she's drinking her coffee, and we're visiting, and she's milling around the kitchen, and all of a sudden, and a great while before, she jumps around, and I, so, so it's been, it's been a, did got Julia too, see? Man, voices coming out of boxes, or you know, it just. <laughs> All right, where do we start this morning? Let's start in Leviticus. How about that? Leviticus chapter 27, if you would open your Bibles there, is where I want to start. We're going to talk about money this morning, and uh, I want to go about this in a little bit different way than I ever have before. I want to just give this, this 10,000 foot view of of kind of what the Bible says a little bit about money. Listen, here's the thing. The Bible probably has more to say about money than just about any other topic outside of a person. The Lord Jesus, probably half the parables that he told have to do with money. Money is a, a, a really, really important thing in our discipleship because the way we treat money is reflective of our hearts. So if we get our heart right, we'll deal with money right. But if we don't, money actually has the power to become a God in our life. And when I say money, I mean wealth, materialism, power, and all that comes with it. Okay, And so, so let's, let's look at this. And just as a reminder, in the Old Testament, and we do need to today, we're going to, to, to draw this dispensational differentiation when we talk about money and, and how to handle money in regards to the church, we have to realize that we live in the church age, okay? We are not Israel. We are not members of the Israelite community. And so as I read this this morning, I need you to understand this was a commandment to the Israelites. And as we think about this, remember, for an Israelite, their religious and civil leadership are combined, all right? So the executive office for Israel is God. The judicial office are the judges. And the legislative office of the Israelites is the Bible. It's the Word of God, all right? And so God's the executive. The Bible, His Word, is the legislative. And the judges then take that and apply that. Okay? And so you and I don't live in Israel. We do not live in a theocracy as far as the way Israel did. Now, if you're an individual Christian, Jesus should be king of your life, and you live under his rule, okay, first and foremost. However, Christians throughout the last 2,000 years are scattered all over the world in every country of the world, and we are to abide in and be good citizens of whichever country we live in. So we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. But in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30, we see there, this one verse, it says, and all the tithe, now what is a tithe? A tithe is simply a word that means one-tenth, okay? So you could, you could read that to say one-tenth. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So Israel had a compulsive tithe that they were supposed to give. What do I mean by compulsory compulsory means it's law you don't this is not up to you you do not decide this it is compulsory okay and so every israelite was to give a tenth of the increase now that's just one we've been through leviticus several years ago we're not going to go back through it 
But let me just remind you, every three years they brought in a tithe that went to uh, the poor. Uh, every year they brought in a tithe that was split amongst the, the Levites that provided for the temple and all of the, the, the goings on at the temple. Then they had both compulsory and free will offerings and sacrifices on top of that. So for an Israelite, they would have given away well over 30% of their income. And a big part of that, at least one-tenth, is compulsory. In other words, they can't... I mean, it's, it's God's. He says you bring it to the temple, you must pay this. All right. So you, you understand the difference between compulsory and free will. When David built the temple... Well, he made the preparations. He didn't get to build it, but he laid the groundwork and made all the preparations, got all the materials ready so that Solomon could complete it. David asked the people for an offering to build the temple. And the people brought and brought and brought and brought. And finally, the Levites went and counted it. And they said, he said, how much you got? And they said, we got, we got this much. And he said, stop, 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 go home. <laughs> we, we don't need any more. Go, go. How many? How many? Church leaders, have you ever? How many leaders in the civil world, politicians, when was the last time a politician came and said, do not give any more taxes, we've got plenty, we don't need it. When was the last time you ever heard a preacher say, please stop giving, we have more than enough, right? So, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, lots of these things get blown out of proportion, and what I would like to do is, is, is sort this out for us. Okay, so here's, here's, here's the distinction in the Old Covenant. They had compulsory offerings and free will offerings. The compulsory offerings would be viewed in some ways like a tax. Because for Israel, their religious and civil government were the same. And so to support those who carried these things out, that tax was imposed as a tithe on the people, one-tenth of what they brought in, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody, amen, compulsory versus free will. Free will is from my heart. Compulsory is, is I have to do this. Let's come to the New Testament. Come to the New Testament. We got four points this morning. Number one, the state gets its part. Amen? And somebody said, the state gets its part. Somebody said it? Let's hear it. Amen, brother. April 15th, my favorite day. I get to go down there and I get to be a good citizen and I get to, I get to be, be part of this country. I like fired fighters, don't you? How many of you like having fire? How many of you like having military to protect our borders? Amen. Police. How about nice roads to drive on? Anybody, amen. Anybody ever left Texas headed for New Mexico? Right? 75 miles an hour. New Mexico, welcome to the land of entrapment. Bam, 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 65 miles an hour, right? And all the undercarriage of your vehicle torn all to pieces, right? So I, I like good roads. I like firefighters. I like, I like judges. I like police officers. I like streets. I like stoplights. I, I like court systems. Amen? Okay. Bible says pay your taxes. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, the state gets its part. Then when the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk, speaking of Jesus, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now think about this. This is, this is telling, okay? The Israelite people were an occupied people. The Romans had occupied them, and they had to pay taxes to the Romans. And the way that the Romans collected their taxes were they chose Israelite people like Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, like Zacchaeus, and many, many others, and they gave them a jurisdiction. And they said, you are responsible for X amount of money from your jurisdiction, Whatever you get over and above that, you can keep. And so they were all extortioners. They were all corrupt, every single one of them. And the Israelites hated it that they had to pay taxes to the Romans. So they asked Jesus, should we do this? Should we pay taxes to the Romans? Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness 
and said, why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? See, they're trying to set him up. They're trying to, if they can get him to say, no, we shouldn't pay taxes to the Romans, well, they'll just run to Pilate and say, this guy is, is telling us not to pay our taxes, and that'll make Jesus uh, in trouble with the law, right? And so he says in verse 19, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Who, whose is the image and superscription? In other words, you know, whose head's on it, right? Is it, you know, Jefferson or Lincoln or what's stamped on it? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. They say unto him, Caesar's. Verse 21, saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar's the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Okay? Romans 13. Romans 13, in case you think that Jesus might have had some other meaning there, Romans chapter 13 and verse 7, render, same word Jesus used, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, that's tax, custom to whom custom is due. We still call it customs. That's, that's what we call it when you bring something from one country into another, duty or custom. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay, So, number one, when it comes to money, God wants for his people, the church, to be tax-paying members of wherever you live. This is the same thing as the compulsory tithe of the Israelites. It is not questionable. We don't debate it. We don't discuss it. Now, thank God we live in a country where we actually get to take part in our government. Therefore, you should take part in it. You should select your leaders prayerfully, or at least try to. You should vote. You should be involved. You should understand these things. You should figure out who's imposing taxes and why, and you should support people who are using that in a good way. Good luck with that. Both sides hammer us. They hammer us with taxes, but... But God says, if you're going to be obedient to God, pay your taxes. Amen? Wow, I don't think I've ever asked for an amen in my life and didn't get one. That's, that is, boy, and so you can see, can you see the Israelites, you see how upset they were about that in their day. Listen, did they like Caesar? No. Did they agree with his policies? No. Did they like what he was doing to their country? No. They didn't like any of that. And yet Jesus says, that belongs to Caesar, render it to Caesar's. Here's one of the main reasons why you should pay your taxes, because they'll throw you in jail if you don't. Guys like Al Capone could get away from the law in every other area except messing with the IRS. You mess with the IRS, they come hunt you down. By the way, the IRS just beefed up their security force by an unbelievable amount because they're going to try to go gather this up. Listen, just pay it. Just pay it. Jesus says pay it. Pay your taxes. It's part of being a Christian. Number two, succor the poor. To succor the poor. Man, I love that word. I think you actually say it, succor. Succor the poor. Matthew chapter 6. Now, I don't mean that to succor them out of their money. I mean that in this term of the old word succor. S-U-C-C-O-R. To succor the poor. You say, preacher, what in the world? I needed an S word really bad for my outline, but... It means to help or to relieve suffering from someone. And I'll show you a couple of places here. Matthew chapter 6. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men. Okay, what are alms? Alms is to relieve suffering. It means to help someone who is in need. All right, So, so sometimes we see somebody and they need help. They've lost their job. They've had some illness that's come upon them, and they don't have the kind of insurance that they need. Uh, their house burned down. They're, you know, I mean, I mean there, there could be any number of, of situations that we find that ourselves in. Sometimes there's just people that are poor, and, and they're always going to be with us, Jesus said. Throughout the New Testament, we see the disciples teaching that we are supposed to help the poor. And so Jesus says... Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may, be seen, may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is personal alms. This is something we all should do. We all have these opportunities. 
Uh, we see somebody, they're in need, and we help them out. We give them a tank of gas. We buy them a hamburger. Uh, we, we help them to pay their rent. We, we well, whatever, you know. And uh, uh, this is alms. By the way, Jesus does not say if you give your alms. He says when. This is something that is expected of us by God that we would help to relieve the poor. Psalm 41. Psalm 41. The first two verses. Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. That's a beatitude. That's a blessing pronounced upon us. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. I don't know about you, but I like that blessing. Don't you? You want that blessing? You want God's protection upon you? You want God to look after you and make sure that you have the things that you need? Well, then you need to consider the poor. You, you don't want to ignore the poor or ex, uh, extortion the poor or oppress the poor. Those, all of those things throughout Scripture always are denounced. Okay, Turn with me now, if you will, to Romans, and let's see a lady that is called a succorer. <laughs> Just so you think I didn't invent the word. Phoebe, Romans chapter 16, and the first two verses. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. So Paul is sending, he knows this lady is traveling to Rome from Centria. He says, hey, I, I'm, I'm putting my stamp of approval on Phoebe. I'm commending her to you. Verse 2, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. So Paul says, hey, Phoebe has helped me. She has helped me. I don't know what way she helped in. But there's a lot of different ways that almsgiving can take place. As Christians, we are entrusted with money by God. Deuteronomy tells us God gives us the ability to make money. You say, no, -uh, I did it myself. Well, how did you do it? Well, I have a job that I use my strong back. Okay, who made your back strong? God did. I have a job that I use my smart mind. Amen. What? Where did you get that smart mind? Where did that come from? From my education. <laughs> well, no, it actually came from God. And so, so if we view the wealth that we have been entrusted with here to not belong to us, but to belong to God, then it changes the entire question for us. How much of it do I keep for myself? How much of it do I distribute and where? The state helps us out with a certain portion of it. They'll tell you how much you're supposed to give them. But a part of what we're supposed to do with, with money to honor God is to help the poor. Okay, So that is to secure the poor. Number three, to support pastors, which are also, also poor guys, right? <laughs> Listen, I don't like preaching on this, but I'm going to because it is discipleship. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Part of giving of your wealth is to support the church and to support preachers, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, uh, other people involved in ministry. This is something that we, all of us as Christians, are called to do. So not only should we help alleviate the poor, does that mean we have to take them to raise? No. Does that mean that we have to make them wealthy and us poor in the process? No, of course not. What it means is, is that we're supposed to help. We're supposed to consider the poor and realize that no government program is ever going to solve the problem of the poor. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And so that will help you as you vote. And certain groups promise you that they're going to do away with poverty someday no, they're not. Matter of fact, the groups that promise it the most create the most of it, in my estimation. But let's talk about preachers for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look with me there at verse 7. Paul says, he asks some questions. Who goeth the warfare at any time his, uh, at his own charges? Do soldiers have to go to war and pay for their, their warring? No, they're, they're supported. They get It may not be much, but they're paid. Maybe it's just their board. 
Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Now he's talking about sharecroppers, somebody who, who is, is tending crops for someone else. Does, does somebody plant this vineyard and, and not get paid? No, of course not. The landowner pays the people who do that. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Well, these are rhetorical questions. The answer to that is, is nobody does. The shepherds get to, they get to have the milk from the flock. They get to butcher a couple of, of uh uh, muttons or, or whatever, whatever their agreement is. They, they get paid to take care of those sheep. Okay, so verse 8. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. I, man, I love this verse. If, if I have a, a, an animal that represents what I do, it's the ox. God uses the ox to talk about preachers. That's what a preacher is, is an ox. And we don't live in a world that uses oxen. I wish we did so we could illustrate this a little bit better. But the difference between pulling something with an ox versus pulling it with a horse or with a mule is night and day difference. It's it's incredible difference. Think back to the old westerns you've seen of the stagecoach, right? The stagecoach was usually pulled by horses, and they couldn't go very far but they went pretty fast. The butter, what is it, the butter, Butterfield, Butter, the Overland, the, uh, the stage that brought the mail and did the whole trip across the United States. Well, they kind of worked like the Pony Express. They had these stations set up all along the way. And they would, the stage would come through, and they're at least trotting, sometimes loping, because they're in a hurry. This is about fast, 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 right? But most of the people who wound up in California, who homesteaded all of that country, they didn't get out there with horses or mules. They got out there with oxen. And when an ox pulls something, it's very, very slow. And he lumbers along. You can walk beside him easily. You can walk in front of him. Somebody that's a horseback could run off and leave the oxen and come back and catch up with them real easily. Well, that's the image. And so Paul uses this here and he says, does God really care for oxen? Because it says, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the corn. Now imagine this. You've got this ox and you have this, this sledge. And what you've done is, is you've cut your grain and now you've got to separate the wheat from the chaff. So you pile it out there on the threshing floor and then you have to pull a threshing sledge over it. So what you do is, is you put an oxen on a circular uh, spindle like a big wheel and you tie him to this thing where all he can do is walk in a circle. And he's pulling this heavy thing that's going to beat up the grain and cause the heads of wheat to break loose from all the the beards. And he's just going to walk in a circle. And the Bible specifically says, don't muzzle him when he does this. As he's walking along, if he wants a bite, he's supposed to be able to reach down and get a bite. And then you're going to make bread out of what he's slobbered on and no telling what else he's done on it. But that's the way they did it. But Paul asked the question, does God really care for these oxen? Why is that there? Well, he says, verse 10, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. Yes, it's an image. It's a metaphor. He says, for our sakes, no doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope. When I was a kid, I used to help my dad farm. And my dad had a distinction and a division in our home that we we were taught when we were little bitty. There's two kinds of work that we do around here. There's chores. And then there's work that you get paid for. Nobody ever got paid to do chores. What are chores? Well, I don't know. Take out the trash, wash the dishes, push a vacuum cleaner, mow the lawn. Um, at my house, it was breaking ice. It was running a feed truck. It was feeding cattle. It was, you know, those were chores. Feeding the horses. Had to do it twice a day, every day, no matter what. Those are chores. But there were paying jobs. Paying jobs usually involved irrigating, farming, things like that, building fence, depending on the situation. But dad, he'd always tell you, and I learned after a while not to ask, you know, I just, that was a chore, okay. Now this is a paying job, oh, okay. And I'm going to tell you what, there's, there's this, there's this something about this, there's, there's a reward attached to this. Now there's a reward for doing chores too, because if you don't do them, you get a whipping, and if you do them, you don't get a whipping, so that's the reward. But for the paying jobs, you knew, hey, this is a paying job. We're going to go work cows for three days as a paying job. I'm like, wow, I'm going to make $75 a day, just like the rest of the men. You know, that was exciting to me. It was motivating to me, and there was a wonderful reward at the end of it, and I wanted to make a good hand, and I wanted to do a good job. And so all of that's free, 
But that's one good thing that you can use to raise kids and to realize that we all are motivated by reward, and there is nothing wrong with that. However, you got to be careful that you're looking for the right rewards, okay? And so he says, he says the, the guy who plows, plows in hope, verse 10, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? What Paul is saying is, is preachers, they share spiritual things with people. That's their job. They dig in the Word. They pray over the Word. They teach the Bible. They teach classes. They, teach, they preach sermons. They whatever. Whatever it is that they do, what capacity they do. They serve as a pastor of a church. Is there anything wrong with them being paid with carnal things? Like what? Like money. Like, like carnal money. Spiritual teaching versus carnal money. That's, that's what he's saying here. Verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Now watch. Nevertheless... We have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You've got to understand that Paul waived his right to be recompensed by the churches. Excuse me. Because he was so focused on evangelism. As he went to these places and he preached to brand spanking new believers, he did not want to strap them with supporting him financially. This is why Paul worked as a tent maker in many places to earn his living making tents and then plant these churches. And so these brand new believers, they didn't understand. He wanted to make sure that they didn't think he was doing this just for the money. And so he says, I, I don't do that. Verse 13, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now he's referring to the Old Testament. The Levites got the, the compulsory tithes of the people that were brought in were distributed amongst the Levites. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. The sacrifices the people brought, that was the food of the Levites and their families. Verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So we're supposed to pay preachers. That's a, that's a part of what God has blessed us with. Uh, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Turn over to Philippians, if you will, real quick. And uh, chapter 4. Now, Paul, as you read the book of Acts, you see that he worked with Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers as well. And at certain times and certain places, he worked with them. And at other times, he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, because sometimes churches sent him love offerings. And when he didn't have to make a living making tents, he could spend all of his time at planting churches. And so the Philippian church... The church of Macedonia was an unbelievably generous church. And so he talks about this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. So he's commending them. You guys did great. He says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now, that's interesting. So the only church, at, that, at least at that period of time, that was actually supporting Paul's missionary endeavors was the Philippian church. Okay? But he goes on and he says, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. So here we see a missionary being supported by a local church that he's not preaching at. He's preaching somewhere else. This church is taking funds and sending them to him so that he can live. Okay? And so uh, uh, verse 17, this is, this is great. Not because I desire a gift. That's not why Paul did this. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Can you hear the reward in that? When you support missionaries, that is fruit that, uh, that, that piles up in your account in heaven. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. You hear that? That is the sweet savor reference to the sweet savor sacrifice of the Old Testament. So by way of review, if you read in Leviticus, there's two kinds of sacrifices. There is a sweet savor sacrifice and there is a non-sweet savor sacrifice. What's the difference? The non-sweet savor sacrifices meant 
that the smoke stunk from those sacrifices to God. Why? Because they were for sin. They were for transgressions. The people had done something they weren't supposed to do, and it was a non-sweet savor offering. They had to make it. But then there were sweet savor offerings. These were non-compulsory offerings. These were free will offerings. And God said, I love that smell of that burning on that altar. I love it. Why? Because the people took from what God had blessed them with, with their cattle, with their sheep, with their goats, with their dove, with their grain, and they had brought it to God, and they'd burned part of it on the altar, and they'd given the rest to the Levites. They'd given it to the poor. They'd given the alms. They'd supported the ministry of the, of the temple. And that's exactly the image that Paul uses here. So, are we Israelites? No, we are the church. But we learn from the types and shadows that we see there. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You want to become a giver? You want to become a generous person? Number one, realize that your wealth doesn't belong to you. You are a steward that is tending God's wealth. It's not how much do I give to the Lord. It's all His. Now, how does He want to use me to distribute it? Part of it goes to support the country in which I live. That's called taxes. Part of it goes to the poor, to help those that are in need. Part of it goes to support ministry. Okay? And so, uh, uh, so number one, the state gets its part. Number two, succor, succor the poor. Number three, support pastors. Number four, save the perishing. Turn with me to the book of Luke. This by far, this is really where I wanted to get to today. This by far is one of the strangest parables in all of the Bible. This is one of the uh, probably very confusing parables for a lot of people. And yet, it is unbelievable once you get it. When the light comes on, you go, wow, makes perfect sense. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. Okay, so what's a steward? Your steward is your, your, your man or woman who does the work. The rich guy owns it, so he owns a business, he owns a farm, he owns whatever. This guy has this, this full business that includes multiple farms as well as the distribution of the goods that are produced on the farms and the, the, the marketing of these. And this steward oversees the whole thing. Okay? So this is your CEO. This is not the, the, the rich man is the owner of the company. The steward is the CEO and CFO of the company. Okay? It was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. So at some, some way, the owner says the steward is he's, he's wasting He's not doing a good job with his stewardship. Somehow he is wasting. Uh, I'm not, we're, we're, our, our production levels are not high enough. Our percentage return is not good. Our balance sheet doesn't look good. And so he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Okay. Now, by the way, if you are an owner or a boss, never do this. Okay? Fire him on the spot and hire someone else to do an outside audit and then go and throw him in jail after that. Don't ever, ever do what this guy did because here's what the wise and shrewd and crafty steward will do. You're supposed to give an account. Oh, okay. So what does he do? Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. He knew he's done. He knew he's going to be fired, but he hadn't been fired yet because he's supposed to give an account. I have to turn the books over to the boss. I've got to fix the books before I turn them over. I cannot dig. To beg, I am ashamed. I'm too old to work with my hands, use my back. I'm not going to, or either that or too proud. I'm not going to dig. I'm not going to do manual labor. And I'm not going to go beg. I'm ashamed to do that. So what am I going to do? And watch, the light bulb goes on. Boom! I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. I know I'm going to get fired, but not yet. I have to give an accounting. So when I turn the books over to the boss, I'm going to make friends with every one of his business people that he's been doing business with, with his customers. Verse 5, So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and he said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? 
Now think about this. I, 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 taking care of my master's business, have sold these. This is the accounts receivable. And it's huge. He hasn't collected any of this money yet. So he brings these people in one at a time. How much do you owe? Verse 6, he said, in 100 measures of oil. This guy, now this is not a measure like a cup. We're talking about gallons and gallons. We're talking about truckloads. Think, think about today. This is truckloads. This is 100 freight cars of oil that I have sold on behalf of my owner and I haven't collected for yet. You see now why he thinks that someone is wasting his goods, right? And so the guy says, I owe a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Whoa! Cut it in half. Now, how's the boss ever going to know what happened? He's not. He has no accounting of what's been going on. He's trusted the steward completely. He has no idea how many truckloads of oil have been sold, how many measures of oil have been sold. So what this guy did is he just gave this guy a 50% rebate on what he bought. Hey, by the way, you're going to have to pay for the 50 loads, but just mark down 50 instead of 100. He goes on and he says, uh, <clears throat> then he said, verse 7, to another, how much owest thou? He said, 100 measures of wheat. Same thing, freight car loads of wheat that this steward had sold, he had collected for yet. He said unto him, take thy bill and write four score. So he just reduced this one down by 20%. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. What? Wait a minute. How do you commend someone who is lying and cheating and conniving and stealing and extorting? That's what he's doing. He's ripping his master off. First of all, he wasn't doing a good job because he's selling stuff that he hasn't collected for yet huge amounts of goods that he hasn't collected for. And now he says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward. Please understand, he doesn't say that he's not unjust. He calls him, that's what, that's what this parable is, the unjust steward. This guy's a crook, but he commended him. Now that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Why? Why are we, we're going to learn a lesson from a crook today. That, that really is what this is all about. Who's telling the parable? Jesus is telling the parable. This, this makes my ears pick up, you know, like a, like a bird dog. You know, I'm like, what, what, what's going on here? So he says, that the Lord commended the unjust steward. Here's why. Because he had done wisely. Then he gives us the punchline. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Boy, ain't that the truth? Now, you may not like that, but Jesus says that, and, and if you just look around, it's so true. Are you watching the shrewdness of the rip-off schemes and scams that are taking place? Just this morning, I get up and read about an FTX cryptocurrency scam and scheme that's been brought out into the open, that they have some slush fund that they've been shifting money through and shifting around. Hey, listen, are you watching the election stuff? Florida has 30 million people. Texas has 20 some odd million people, or maybe it's the other way around. Arizona only has 7 million people, and it's taken them a week to count the votes. Florida and Texas were done within the day before midnight. Either they are incompetent or they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Have you noticed how shrewd they are? You ever want to watch those true crime deals, you know? Uh, my, my sister, she likes to listen to the true crime podcast. And it just, it, it's, it's always just unbelievable when you see the shrewdness. I always say this. Anytime somebody is a really good thief or crook, had they just worked that hard at a legitimate job, they'd be successful, Right? And here we are as Christians, and we're just dumb enough to think that, that God owns it all, that, that I should be generous with what I give, that I should actually pay my taxes honestly, that I should get up and go to work and work my job and be content with my pay. And, you know, and, and we're, just, you know, we're just going through life, and we're not trying to figure out how to cheat the system. But there are people that are cheating the system every day with auto insurance, the scams that they run with the auto insurance stuff. And they are crafty and they are wise. And by the way, go back to the garden. Remember what it said about the serpent. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which is the Lord God had made. 
So where do they learn this craftiness? Well, they learn it from the serpent. They learn it from the old devil, right? But Jesus says this, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So let's think about what that steward did. The steward used a reduction in the bill of the debtors to his master in order to indebt these people to him. He knows he's going to lose his job. But every one of them, after he's kicked out, he, does, he tells us about two of them. I don't know how many he did this with. But here in a, a week when he gets fired after he turns these books in, and then he uses up all of his savings in a month or so, he's going to be looking for a job. But he says, I'm not going to take just any old job. I'm not going to dig, and I'm sure not going to beg. Who's the first person he's going to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I need a job? That guy that he reduced his bill by 50%. That's who he's going to call. And he's going to say, hey, you what? You owe me a favor, don't you? That guy could literally give that guy 50 loads, 50 measures of oil worth of pay and still be square. You see? And so he has very craftily indebted all of these people to him. Now, he's cheated his master, no doubt. But Jesus commends him in this. He says there, verse 9, here's the punchline. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. And that's what Jesus calls money, the mammon of unrighteousness. Make to yourselves friends. Listen, why does he call money the mammon of unrighteousness? Because 1 Timothy, if you want to turn there, 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells us, this is, this is just truly amazing. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money. It's when you love it. And by the way, rich people love money, but poor people can love money just as much or more. Whether you have it or wish you had it doesn't make any difference. You can still love it, okay? And when you love something more than God, then that means you worship it. It becomes an idol, and that's why it gets named Mammon, because Mammon is the name of an, Arama an Aramaic name of a god. And so what, what Jesus is saying is he says, use money, okay? Money is a means of transaction. doesn't matter whether it's the worthless printed stuff that we have, you know, these, these Federal Reserve notes or whatever, they, they, these, these are not even worth the paper that they're printed on. They are absolutely backed by nothing, just good faith. That's it. And you know, who, who knows what those things are worth? Go look at a chart of what the dollar was worth 100 years ago versus what it's worth today. I mean, it's just incredible how, how it's devalued. But it doesn't matter whether we're talking about that or whether we're talking about gold and silver, whether we're talking about oil, whether we're talking about crypto, whether we're, any kind of means of exchange. Okay, If you fall in love with that, if you desire that, it's going to be a God in your life. So... What should we do? We should learn from an unjust steward. We need to, and we're not saying that we need to learn how to cheat people, but we need to learn how to rightly use money. So this is the punchline. He says, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. You know what most people do in this world? Most people use people to make money. We do it subtly. Sometimes it's as, it's as simple as, you know, well, you know, who do I know that I could, could hit up about this deal? How many rich people do I know who could fund my, my thing that I want to do? Or how many, how many people do I know that I could talk into doing this? Multi-level marketing campaigns are absolutely the worst. The pyramid scheme stuff, you know. How many, how many of my friends can I dupe how quickly so that I can build, up my, build my down thing before everybody figures this out and it doesn't work anymore? But most people in this world use people to make money. If you don't believe me, how many businesses call the department human resources <laughs> do we do we really view humans as resources 
Well, we do if the bottom line is making money. And by the way, that's what the corporate world is. The entire corporate world, the bottom line is making money, okay? And so, am I saying don't work in the corporate world? No, I'm saying understand what's going on. Understand what part money plays. Jesus says, don't use people to make money. Use money to make friends. Look what he says. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, and listen to me, you will. You will fail. You say, I'm not going to fail. Yes, you will. One of these days you're going to get too old to do what you do. One of these days you're going to die. And I have never once seen a hearse with a U-Haul attached to the back of it. Amen? You cannot take it with you. You know what rich people do? They want something named after them. Well, I need a building named after me or a street named after me. We'll go back to Matthew 6 and the alms. Remember what he said? If you do your alms so that you'll be recognized by men, you have your reward. Way to go. You got a building named after you. Yay. How about a pew in a church? You ever been in one of those places? Man, it makes me sick to my stomach. I can't tell you how many people I've offended by pointing this out. I walk in this church and this pew donated by so-and-so, so-and-so. Yay, that's your reward. You ain't getting no reward in heaven. You got a pew. Way to go. You got a brick. You got a chunk of sidewalk. You got a star in, in Hollywood on the ground. You got, a, you got a street named after you. You got whatever, right? Use the mammon of unrighteousness to make friends. He says, <clears throat> That when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Can you hear what, can you hear what he's saying? Use money here for godly purposes and for reward there. Invest here in the things that Jesus says to invest in so that you'll have reward there. You're not going to see all of it in this life. You're not going to see most of it in this life. By the way, most wealthy people are living on old money that they didn't make anyway. Somebody invested in something that took 100 years. You ever been past a pecan orchard? People who plant pecan trees are thinking about grandchildren. Do you know how long it takes for a pecan orchard to actually begin to produce? When I go to Arizona, every year when I, when I go out there for the summer cowboy camp meeting, there are some huge pecan orchards on the New Mexico-Arizona border to drive past. Every time I drive past, there's a bunch in Roswell too, I grew up around pecans. And every time I drive past those, I think about the families that I know that, that planted those trees. If, if I want to benefit from it, I don't plant a pecan orchard. Because it takes too long. <laughs> it, takes, it takes years and years and years for those trees to begin to produce enough to pay off and to actually have an income. But when you see a mature stand of producing pecan trees, you're seeing something that was done generations ago that now it's paying off. Well, now let's think farther. Let's think farther than that. Let's think about standing before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ someday and, and to, to stand there and to say, Lord, I used this mammon of unrighteousness, this money that has the potential to become a God. I used it for your purposes. I paid my taxes. I was a good citizen. I tried to help the poor when I had opportunities to. I supported my local church and my local pastor. And I used that money to make friends that are eternal friendships. Who is going to welcome you when you show up in heaven? When you fail here on this earth and you're going to fail. You're going to get old. You're going to get amnesia. You're going to get Alzheimer's. You're going to get broken down in your back. You're going to get crippled. You're going to get slow. You're going to get tired. You're going to get dead. Somebody said? You said, it ain't going to happen to me. Yes, it is. It's going to. One or all or all of the above is going to happen to you. You're going to fail. Whatever it is that you do that makes your money, you're going to fail at that someday. It's going to come to an end. Guess what? Thieves can break in and steal. Moth and rust can destroy. It's amazing what can happen to this money here on this earth. But how much of it have you sent on ahead? How much of it have you invested in these things? And by the way, when you show up in heaven someday and you walk up there and here they come, all these friends that are going to welcome you in, 
Where'd they come from? Well, they used to be lost, but now they're saved. And they're saved because they heard the gospel, either from you or from some missionary that you supported or from some preacher that you helped pay his salary or from some ministry that you supported, some, some poor person that you helped and you gave it to them and the, the, you didn't let your left hand know what your right hand was doing. You just wrote a little note with it and you said, this is from Jesus. He loves you. And they looked at that and they, they paid their rent that month and they said, I don't know who Jesus is, but I need to find out. And so they went to the local church right around the corner. And they came in and they heard some preacher preach the gospel. And they said, I want that. I want that for me. And someday, you're not even going to know these people here on earth, most of them. You're not even going to know who they are. They might be in some other country. Don't even speak your language. And you're going to come walking into these eternal dwellings, these mansions that Jesus has gone to build for us in glory. And you're going to walk in there and they're going to go, hey, I'm here because of you. You played a part in this. Use this mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Verse 10. By the way, here's what some people say. I, I promise I'm going to be done by noon. We've got 14 more verses to look at. I'm just kidding. They say, if I had more money, I'd give more. And I'm going to say this to you. No, you won't. You will not. Look at verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. If you take your little meager little lawn mowing money that you made, not for mowing your own parents' lawn because that's a chore, for mowing your neighbor's lawn because that's a paying job, right? Some kids are going, what? Wait a minute. No, I'm just kidding. But you made 50 bucks, right? And you say, I'm going to give part of this. I'm, I'm going I'm to take this 50 bucks. I want to invest this in the kingdom of heaven. Well, you're going to have to pay some taxes because here pretty soon they're going to do away with all this paper money anyway and they're going to know how much you made. But uh, you're 1099, you're going to have to pay some taxes on it. So part of that's got to go out. You've got to save that. If you're a private contractor, you're going to get 1099. So keep your, keep your receipts, keep your money, get ready. Right? Amen? Somebody said amen. Don't you love it? I love it. I'm so excited. April 15th is my favorite day. Right? And then you say, you know what? I'm going to put part of it in here. It's in that box right back there. We don't pass an offering plate. It's in that box. It's up to you. But you say, you know what? I want to help pay for Roddy and Wendy's rent this month. So I'm going to put a little in there. I'm going to help to pay the light bill here, which, by the way, has gone up significantly this year. Right. I want to help to support missionaries. I want to help to, to give some of this to, to somebody who's poor. And you, you take that, that little bit, and it's, it's like a dollar. By the way, I want you to know Dakota is, is very diligent about this. It doesn't matter how much money you give. He records that, keeps up with that. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I thought your left hand wasn't supposed to know what your right hand's doing. He says that in regard to giving alms directly to poor people. When it comes to, when it comes to number one, to giving the state its part, take every legal and legitimate deduction that you have, amen? And one of those is what you give to a church. So that's why we keep up with that. But kids who put 50 cents in an envelope and write, this is, you know, this is Julia's 50 cents, we keep up with that. We give you a receipt at the end of the year. Why? Because that's important. It's important for you to learn how to do this. You need to learn now because you're... But listen to me. He that's faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. And he that is unjust in the least is also unjust in the much. If you don't tithe off of $10, you're sure not going to tithe off of $10,000. That's the whole point. doesn't matter how much you make. You know, no, the greatest commendation that Jesus makes in the Gospels about money goes to a woman who gave two pennies into the treasury he and his disciples are sitting there watching the people give and this woman goes and he knew she she gave two little mites the two smallest little coins that someone could have this poor woman goes and she puts that into the temple church. some people wouldn't have even wasted their time to go to the temple with that amount of money but she took two of them and put them in there and jesus said that woman has given more than all all the rest of these. And they're going, what are you talking about? I just watched that guy haul a wagon load of stuff up here and go to giving it piles of silver and gold. And he said, no, 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 here's the difference. She gave everything that she had. That's all the money that she had. Those people have given out of their abundance. You see, she gave everything that she had. Real quick, five minutes. 
Give me five minutes, I want to show you a couple of things. Turn to 2 Corinthians real quickly with me, if you will. He says, If therefore ye have been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. By the way, you and I, we haven't even seen those true riches yet. The mansion that Jesus has gone to make for us in glory, the streets that are paved with gold, the, 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 the ministry of carrying on his kingdom during the millennial reign. I have no idea what that looks like, but it can't even compare with what's going on here. Second Corinthians, so what that tells us is, is that this time is a testing ground for the future. If he can trust you with unrighteous mammon here, then he can trust you with true riches there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. Here's a few principles for giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Never let somebody talk you into some church program of giving that you don't have. When I was a kid, we used to do this faith promise thing when it came to missions. And we would promise that we would give. So what the church was trying to do was figure out how they could budget for missions. And so they would say... You need to do faith promise. And so if you could, can you give a dollar a week or two dollars a week or ten dollars a week? Well, at the time, I had no idea. I mean, some weeks I didn't make any money. Other weeks I made a little bit of money. Right. So I, I, I could, how could I do that? Every year, mom would tell me, don't fill it out. Don't fill it out. I always did. And I always I always messed it up, you know, and she's like, oh, so she'd have to correct it for me, you know. But listen, don't let people talk you into that. The Bible says right here that you need a willing mind. The only compulsory part of this whole thing is your taxes. You don't have to support the poor. You don't have to support the church. And you don't have to, to give to missions or anything like that. God's not going to make you. He's not going to force you. The, the government will, but, but the church won't. I used to live in a town where there was a church. And they kept very strict records of all their tithing. And they also wanted everybody to turn in their, their uh, W-2s a copy of their W-2 their w to the church. And they would compare what, you, what the government said you made with what you had given to the church. And then, you know, halfway through the year, they'd come and they'd send you a little letter and say, hey, you, you ain't quite there on your... <laughs> Listen to me. You will never, ever get anything like that around here. I would never do something like that. And I would never go to a church that did something like that. But he says it's a willing mind, and it's, it's accepted according to what a man hath, and not according to the he hath not. Listen to me. We don't need for people to come in here and make some big promise that you're going to give X amount to. Don't do that. You give out of what the Lord has blessed you. If the Lord's blessed you with $100, you give a portion of that willingly. Look at chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart. Can you see that? A willing mind and a purpose in your heart. You need to pray about and think about and plan your giving. You need to do that. A man and his wife need to sit down and they need to plan their giving. Just like you need to plan your going. My wife and I, years ago, we sat down and we said, we're going to go to church. So we design our week around being here or wherever, wherever we were. This was before I was in ministry, before I was a pastor, before I taught a Sunday school class, before anything. We said, look, look, if it's at all possible, we're going to go to church. So we set up our timetable around that. We also decided, hey, we're going to honor God with our money. And so we're going to give a portion. You need to sit down and make a plan. How much should I give, preacher? It's up to you. It's up to you. That is up to you. That is up to you and your spouse and your family and the Lord. I can tell you this. I use a round figure of 10% because of the pattern of the tithe in the Old Testament. But at the end of the year, we always wind up giving more than simply 10% because alms opportunities come up, mission opportunities come up, and then just various other things that pop up through the year. I'm not telling you that to try and brag. I'm just telling you that just to, just to tell you that's what me and Wendy have come up with prayerfully. But he says there, Every man according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Listen, if you can't give it cheerfully, just keep it. Because you ain't giving it the way that it's supposed to be given. But look at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Four things. The state, the poor, the church, and missions. 
Those are the things that God wants us to give to. And anything and everything that falls into that. Amen? You say, is this important? Yes. Does God watch? You better believe it. You better believe it. God, God sees every... God says that there is not a cup of cold water that's given in the name of Jesus that he doesn't know about, that he doesn't recognize. To the very penny God sees when you give. He knows your heart. He wants you to be generous. And he wants you to realize that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, why did I preach this message? Not because we need money. Not because I want to raise. I don't. And we don't. This church is unbelievably generous. Even though this year has been less than some future years, we had an abundance coming in this year. God takes really good care of us. You are unbelievably generous to me and my family as a pastor financially. Y'all always have been. And I am so grateful for that. It's a blessing. This is a big part of discipleship. And we've got a lot of young people. These are the kind of things that we need to learn. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, this is, this is what we need to learn and understand is, is that God wants us to cheerfully give and to trust Him. Amen? Amen? Father, we just love You and praise You. We thank You for Your Word. And God, we just ask You to help us to, uh, to realize that investment in the kingdom of heaven is is so important. We may not see the returns on it today, but it's like planting a pecan orchard. I do that in faith, knowing that my grandchildren are going to benefit from that. God, I, I pray that we might be able to look way, 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 way beyond grandchildren, great-grandchildren, look all the way to the judgment seat of Christ and to realize that we can store up for ourselves treasures in heaven and that we might make those kind of investments from the least of us to the, to the oldest of us, from these little ones learning how to, to handle money all the way up to, to us adults, Lord. Help us to honor you with the money that you have entrusted to us, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we give you this time now in Jesus' name.